So uh, welcome uh, everyone to this Carson International Miller Thompson uh, session. It's one of a series of sessions on hot topics on customs and international trade. My name is Dan Kisselback. I'm a partner with Miller Thompson, uh, one of Canada's law, uh, national law firms, and I lead the practice on customs and international trade matters. And with me is Dave Pentland, a VP of Carson International and a customs broker and a well-recognized uh, one at that. So our topic uh, for today is uh, risk minimization strategies. Um, as part of risk minimization strategies, we'll speak briefly on the um, relatively new enhanced U.S. tariffs on aluminum uh, goods exported from Canada uh, and dealing with the uh, risk of potential countermeasures that are going to be imposed uh, on U.S. origin goods. Um, you know, here we are having settled the, uh, the Canada-U.S. Uh, Canada uh, um, Mexico agreement, the USMCA, and we're back into a trade dispute. And uh, it appears that the Trump administration has slapped on 10% uh, duties and and now Canada's uh, uh, planning to impose countermeasures. So, uh, Dave, what are your thoughts on this particular issue? Um, so, I guess, uh, first off, uh, Section three, 232 duties uh, is, is really um, um, designed by the U.S. government when the U.S. government's under threat and the president can bypass uh, Senate and Congress and really at a stroke of a pen, he can decide to uh, impose things. Um, and so the uh, current sitting president has used this as a means to uh, decide when he wants to get back at certain uh, countries. And, and so uh, the, uh, the US is, is really, um, there's a large lobby group in the United States that uh, feels that Canadian aluminum has been picking upon the United States at uh, lower than market prices and therefore uh, Trump imposed a 10% uh, duty effective August 16th on mainly a raw aluminum articles going into the United States to be used in uh, production. So what's happened is Canada is, is when you get in a trade dispute, we've got to, you know, if they've done something, we have to impose something. So, um, you know, uh, Canada has been looking at retaliatory tariffs on U.S. goods uh, in response to this decision. So, um, Alfie, you go to the next slide, please. Uh, now, now, the problem is, is that Canada by no means imports as much aluminum as we export. So, therefore, uh, if you take uh, the $3.4 billion worth of uh, aluminum that is exported to the United States that's now uh, attracting a 10% duty, Canada has to take this, uh, well, doesn't have to take, but has taken that they uh, want to impose on the same monetary amount. So they've uh, uh, looked at a list of uh, products and those products, um, there is a table uh, that is, there's an active link there on the presentation, so you can go to it. And they're looking to impose 10% starting September 16th on, on, on that uh, list of goods. So on that list, there's a lot of aluminum articles, but it, when we run out of aluminum, they've got into things like uh, washing machines, bicycles, um, golf clubs will be subject to 10% surtax. So right now, the Canadian government's made it open that up until September 6th, which is an interesting day, it's Sunday on a long weekend, but I'm not sure why they picked that date. You can actually email with, if you're a Canadian company, with the HS codes and why these uh, import measures adding 10% surtax coming into Canada will affect your business. So really it's the one last Hail Mary that uh, we're putting out there that you have uh, a couple days to actually uh, email um, and the email is on the next slide, Elfie. Um, you can uh, email and, um, and, and make your case. And so, uh, in there, there's uh, four points. So, you know, you have to list your company name, your, your relevant eight-digit uh, uh, HS code, and the reasons that you're expressing support or concern for the proposed countermeasures. And um, on on there, I'm suggesting that people copy in their MP as well. Certainly, if you have a sitting MP of the uh, a Liberal government that's in power right now, it would uh, it would. Uh, help you out a little bit more, but uh, we'll just have to see what happens. So uh, right now it's scheduled as se September 16th, that if uh, based on the comments, they'll decide what's the final list and some of those goods will then be subject to the 10% surtax coming in. So, and so Dan, after those uh, present, uh, you know, uh, optimistic, uh, you know, um, points on aluminum, I'll, I'll let you talk about advanced rulings. 
Well, I guess, uh, thanks, uh, David. Uh, you know, the last time we saw tariffs on crazy things like Maine, maple syrup imported from Maine, that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it could be a wide range of different types of goods that are going to be impacted. And uh, so we'll have to see what uh, shakes out as a result of the submissions and, uh, and what the uh, government decides to do. Uh, advanced rulings. Uh, something near and dear to our hearts. Uh, it's a means of risk minimization. The general concept here is that uh, you go to the government and you ask them uh, to give you a binding statement, a statement that is binding on the government as to where goods fall within uh, you know, their classification, origin, and sometimes value under a national customs ruling. And uh, then in, in such case, uh, you can go forth and import goods uh, having that comfort that it will receive the treatment set, up, set out in the advanced ruling. Um, the other way of doing things is to just import and, and uh, come up to your, uh, with your own conclusions and they may be good ones, but uh, the government's not bound uh, to your conclusions and uh, you may have a situation where you have an unwelcome uh, surprise and unwanted attention. Uh, generally, this happens in the course of a customs verification where the CBSA takes a contrary view uh, on origin, classification, and valuation issues. And that leads to um, customs disputes. And that's not where uh, most people want to be. So there's a section here that we talk about. This section uh, it provides for the uh, granting of uh, advanced rulings is basically a statement that binds uh, the CBSA uh, to uh, a position as to whether or not goods qualify as originating goods under a, a free trade agreement uh, and, and uh, uh, for exporters, uh, other matters and tariff classification of goods. On to the next slide, uh, Alfie, please. So tariff classification be can be complex. So can origin, by the way, and valuation. They can all be complicated. Uh, what we typically do, and I, David, you can jump in on this, is to provide an outline of what the issue is. You know, whether or not the goods should be properly classified under you know uh, this particular tariff provision or that tariff provision, and then we provide a roadmap for the uh, government to follow. Uh, and, and reach a conclusion so that we set out what our position is, what, what, what we think the good should be, rather than just providing an outline to the government and hoping for the best. And that uh, gives us uh, some certainty, or gives our clients some certainty and mitigates risk. Yeah, and I guess one comment, Dan, is that um, this day and age, the HS uh, tariff classification, you know, is set up between 190 plus uh, uh, World Trade Organization countries that subscribe to it, and, and a lot of the uh, the language within that is, is based on uh, past products, and and so a lot of times the products are created every day that are unique and have different uh, aspects uh, according to technology, et cetera, et cetera, and they're not mentioned, and so uh, it, it's beholden upon people that if, if you've got something unique and it doesn't fit into one of the baskets. And uh, if you pick a basket that's uh, uh, the uh, other basket and uh, you want it to actually mention somewhere else, it, it's maybe time to force, um, certainly in this case, CBSA or CBP into uh, uh, deciding where, where it fits into as far as HS codes. And, and often you'll see items that actually are put forward at the WTO where they actually will want to change the verbiage and have the blessing of all the WTO countries to actually put it actually in the tariff itself and, and name something, so. Yeah, so who can request a ruling? Uh, it's gotta be an importer or it can be an exporter producer uh, of goods uh, and goods uh, who are uh, persons who are authorized to account for goods. On to the next slide, Al. Uh, how do you do it? Basically, you make a submission. It's a it's a paper process. You've got to put in the requisite information, like you, the uh, person's identity and the address and the business number and the statement of uh, what their status is and what, what their um, uh, whether or not they are an importer, exporter, producer, or an authorized representative, so that the it's clear that they have the entitlement to to request a ruling. On to the next slide. 
Uh, also additional information as to the principal ports of entry through which the goods will be imported and uh, whether or not the goods are subject to a current uh, uh, administration or enforcement activity such as a tariff uh, 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 classification verification or an administrative review. What the government doesn't want to get involved in is giving an advanced ruling when some other officers dealing with the same thing somewhere else in, in, in the CBSA and that causes uh, friction if you try to do that. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend you try doing that. Moving on to the next uh, slide. Whether or not the goods have been previously imported, they want to have a history of what, what the imports are, a full description of the goods, the, their composition, the process of manufacturing, the description of the packaging, the anticipated end use, uh, and, 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 and most importantly, I think what the, the classification you consider important and your rationale. So in many cases, we'll use rationale, uh, which includes, you know, what is the words of the provision? Uh, what are the headings? Uh, and then are the, there's general interpretive rules. What are the rules? How do they apply? Uh, what are the cases? There's a World Customs Organization compendium of classification rulings. The uh, regard shall be had, it says in the customs tariff, to those, those cases. So there's a whole raft of things where you can build your case and set out what your rationale is and leading inexorably to the conclusion that you want to reach, which is that it has to fit within a particular classification. David, is that consistent um, with your view? Yeah, I, I'm, I just echo your thoughts exactly. I mean, it's, uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a comfort knowing uh, if you get the advance ruling back based on the information, but it's, it's, it's almost like your little day in court where you get to uh, uh, plead your specifics and why you believe that it should be um, uh, qualify within the HS code. So it's, it's your chance to kind of put forward information that maybe customs doesn't uh, consider um, and um, they can make their case and yeah, so. Yeah, so, so just to give you a, an example, we just recently dealt with a case involving wood flooring. Well, we have depictions and descriptions and there's several types of models and all this wonderful stuff. And so what the government has done, uh, you know, we thought we put together a good uh, information package, but they said, eh, give us a sample. We want to take a look at how it is imported. Or we want to see how it's packaged, how it's held out, all these wonderful things. So we sent it uh, to, to the CBSA and we got our ruling along the lines of what we suggested. Another one we did was uh, in respect of the classification of screens, these high technology screens that go into uh, a certain high um, you know, um, uh, resolution um, uh, videos and stuff like that. Uh, we uh, got a hold of the CBP in Buffalo and we provided a description and depiction of the goods. And then the CBP officer phoned us up or we set up a video call and we kind of explained what it was and, and the, and the uh, client went through the whole pro process of manufacturing, which, which was relevant. And then we had the uh, goods uh, had a ruling that was issued by the CBP in about 30 days after that. So that's the kind of process that you go through. On to the next slide. So here we say, you know, you, you get the, you, you, you normally just file a request and it's a paper process, the product literature, the drawings, depictions and depiction, uh, descriptions, schematics, and there's a whole list of requirements that are set out in the customs memorandum as to how you put it all together. On to the next slide. Here's where they're not going to do it. Uh, if it's before the courts, obviously, they're not going to issue a ruling if it's before the courts because some judge is going to make a decision on this thing. Where there's a redetermination on identical goods, well, there's already a process, a uh, statutory code of appeal for initial determinations, redeterminations, further redeterminations, and so on and so forth. They're not going to mess around with it there. Or it's not uh, possible to determine all the material facts. You've got to give them all the material facts upon which it's possible to render an opinion. And if you can't do that, then they're not, just not going to make a decision. Or the request is hypothetical. It's just kind of like a nice to know piece of information. It doesn't really uh, pertain to a particular import. Uh, then they you know, they just don't want to do that. They don't think that it's a good use of their resources. So uh, on to the next slide. Uh, another situation where there's multiple goods on the request uh, should be focused on one particular type of good. 
the goods have already been imported and uh, it's not going to continue. Well, it's who can help you? You've already imported the goods. So uh, it's been uh, determined uh, at the time of importation that the goods are whatever you presented them at. And then after that, the CBSA has a right to further to redetermine the classification of goods. So an advance really won't get you anywhere. The request uh, involves a proposed or draft legislation. Well, again, that gets into the hypothetical if it's proposed or draft legislation, who cares? uh the goods are subject to a verification well you're already into the enforcement and administration of the of the of the act a verification officer is already going to be tasked to deal with this issue so another officer dealing with an advanced ruling doesn't want to touch it advanced rulings are in effect from the date of issue as so long as the ruling has not been modified cancelled or reversed and we just recently had a case involving an advanced ruling well, it's not so recent, but within the last year or so, and uh, it was involving uh, Mr. Noodles. Uh, they had a ruling that uh, the goods uh, were noodles, and that's at 4% duty. And then, uh, lo and behold, somebody in CBSA said, hey, we think it's a suit. It's up, uh, subject to 6% duty, and they issued an assessment. Well, we had to go back to the CBSA and said, hey, they've got a, they have an, a ruling. You can't assess them. Cancel the assessment. They did cancel the assessment. But going forward, they took the position that these goods were a soup. And so we had to uh, fight the issue in the CITT and we eventually won for and on behalf of the, uh, of, uh, the company called Anderson Watts. Uh, and uh, they were importing these Mr. Noodles goods. So if there is a question like that, you have a ruling, then you should be able to be free and clear of any adverse assessments, but they can cancel it and they can change their position. The government can change its position on a go forward basis. Disputing an advanced ruling? Uh, well, you can do it. Uh, there's a, a particular process. Uh, you can uh, provide, uh, you know, it's a paper process again. Uh, uh, and uh, you have to make your submissions within a particular period of time, which is uh, 90 days uh, from the uh, relevant uh, act, uh, import act. Now, the letter uh, must be uh, sent to the uh, regional recourse office, and uh, there's a D memorandum that deals with it. So. Yeah, I'll just jump in there with a comment, Dan, that uh, even though if you dispute uh, an advance ruling, the ruling is in place from the date that it's issued. So we hmm. do have people that object to a, an advance ruling. They don't believe that CBSA um, um, is correct. Uh, so the, the broker uh, or the importer at that time actually has to follow the ruling, even though it's under dispute. So it, if you do win, you can go back and, and reapply and uh, ask for the uh, duty back. But uh, I guess a case in point is that it's effective as of the, the date of the ruling. So. Yeah, it's like any other order, I guess, Dave. It, it, it's effective unless it's overturned. Correct. So you can't fool around with it. On to the next slide. Similarly, advanced rulings under free trade agreements. Uh, there's another provision that deals with uh, free trade agreements and uh, you can uh, get rulings only in relation to the subject matter set out in the provisions under the free trade agreements. On to the next slide. And so we've uh, put together in a handy dandy chart, uh, the uh, uh, rules of origin under these uh, free trade agreements. You have to be an expert in acronyms to understand which ones these are, but uh, these are Canada's free trade agreements, or at least some of them. On to the next chart. And this is the eye chart that we've given you to uh, make sure that you can uh, see well. We're going to send this uh, or make it available uh, to you after this uh, session. Uh, de dealing with the, the agreements and the abbreviations and so forth. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, I guess the reason we put the eye chart in there is that it, that's currently all the FTAs that Canada is involved with. And uh, the um, it, there's an active hyperlink in there. So it, it kind of debunks some of the uh, a, the um, acronyms and, and also uh, looks, you look at sort of the, when they came in force and when they're signed. So. Yeah. So it's kind of a useful chart just uh, for the visually impaired like myself. It's a little bit difficult to see. On to the next slide, please, uh, Alfie. Advanced ruling origin, who may apply? And again, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, importers of the goods uh, under free trade agreements, persons who are authorized to account for them and so forth. On to the next slide. 
export to the producers of the goods. Uh, and then uh, there's specific provisions, I guess, for uh, uh, countries uh, uh, such as uh, Costa Rica, Peru, Colombia, and so forth, and Israel. So you got to take a look and make sure that you have what I would call jurisdiction uh, to, uh, to do um, what you want to do, which is make a request. And that's why you need the handy eye chart, because that will help you tie things in. You can reference the provision under the free trade agreement when you're making the application for the ruling. On to the next uh, chart. Uh, you can only make them in relation to future importations in 120 days prior to the importation. They don't want to get any last minute uh, situations. Uh, it takes a while to kind of weed through all the information. And generally, I don't know what your uh, feeling is, David, but it takes more than 30 days generally to get a ruling out of uh, CBSA. Yeah, I don't think uh, in my 30 plus years of, of this, uh, I've, ne I've never seen one under 30 days. Uh, unfortunately, Canada is a little different than the United States. The United States is bound uh, by a regulation to try and get a, a response back in 30 days, where Canada, it's pretty open that they try and get to it within 120 days, but we've seen those go as far as 180 days plus. Right. And so uh, the other point here is that it's restricted to an individual product or issue, um, and uh, there be, uh, it could get rejected if it uh, um, if the application relates to more than five separate products, unless there's a good reason for doing so. Say it's one type of good and there's five different models or something like that. We had one involving uh, wood flooring. And uh, so that was a situation where they wanted to have the um, different types of uh, like the models of the wood flooring sample sent in uh, to go straight to Ottawa so that they could figure it all out from there. On to the next uh, slide. Uh, must be submitted in the form of a letter and uh, this uh, handy uh, D memo uh, tells you how to do it. On to the next slide. Uh, issued within 100 days, uh, uh, 120 days of receipt, ideally. I mean, sometimes these uh, deadlines are treated as a guide, not really as a, you know, a fixed and etched in stone situation. And if uh, the government feels that it needs more time, they invariably ask for more time. And it's not a good situation to really push them because you might not get the answer you're seeking if you push too hard. On to the next slide. Where the CVSA has received a, a complete information, but, uh, um, we can't uh, issue the advanced ruling within 120 days. It will allow the importation. And then when it gets around to making the decision, you'll get the benefit of that decision. So it will be uh, treated with retrospective uh, effect. Uh, so um, so that's, that's a helpful pro provision. If they can't make the decision and you want to import it, you can import it. You take the risk that it's not going to be ruled in, as you suggested. But if it is, then you get the benefit of that ruling. On the next uh, slide. Here's where they won't do it. Um, you know, again, where there's some sort of administration or enforcement activity or there's some sort of appeal activity. Uh, for example, A, where there's a verification being conducted, uh, B, where there's a request for redetermination of origin or marking or, or something like that, um, and uh, C, where there's a request that's before the Canadian International Trade Tribunal, the courts, or some other uh, type of uh, adjudicative body. Next slide, please. Where you don't have all the facts, again, you've got to have all the facts, uh, where the acceptance uh, of the request would result in uh, I guess too many different products uh, produced by this single producer and um, where the, the it, it deals with a uh, uh, importation that's already ha uh, taken effect because there's no point to getting a, a, a advanced ruling. It's not advanced anymore. Go ahead. Next slide. Uh, it's it, an advanced ruling origin. Again, similar sort of situation. You've got to have all the material facts and circumstances. If you meet the, the, the conditions um, uh, and, and there's no other uh, ruling that has been, that is applicable um, 
and the importation is made by an applicant or somebody else that's importing the goods onto the next. You can review it. You can review an advance ruling uh, by filing a request for review, and there's a process for doing that. Next slide, please. Uh, the CBSA will make a decision. Uh, there's provisions that allow for the government to make a decision, either confirming or setting aside the original decision. Uh, and the, uh, and the uh, order, as David pointed out, the original advance ruling stands unless it's set aside. If it's set aside, then that uh, decision is the one that stands and it applies back to the original date of the um, advance ruling. Go ahead. Next slide. Uh, subsection uh, 43.1 um, doesn't uh, provide for custom valuation, so uh, it's really a technical point. You apply for a national customs ruling. Um, I didn't really understand the purpose of having two types of different uh, request processes, but that's the way we do things. So, um, so then you can get a valuation um, uh, request going. Uh, there are complicated valuation issues, as David uh, well knows, dealing with, uh, you know, even just the application of the transaction value, the, the most basic primary valuation method. Uh, there are technical issues that uh, get, um, uh, uh, you know, explored uh, in real life situations, uh, often dealing with non-resident importers. Yeah, I, I think, Dan, the, I've been led to believe by CBSA's comments is that the reason they have uh, two processes is that anything to do with valuation on an NCR um, goes beyond um, just the officers reviewing uh, the, the products uh, and it actually goes to management because they want to take a look at past valuation issues. And so it's instead of having one system and two separate subsystems, they decided to have two separate systems because one uh, goes to management and uh, for o overview. And, um, you know, as you're well, you know, Dan, you're well aware we've been involved in some valuation issues that get pretty complex. So. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. On to the next slide, Delphi, please. So then again, you get the written statement outlining how the customs legislation applies to goods in Canada. And then in that situation, you reach a point of Zen. You will not have to worry about uh, problems going forward. If you import high volume goods or low volume goods on a, on a high uh, repeated basis uh, and you get a verification letter, you're not in a position of jeopardy potentially. Uh, and so uh, that's why many uh, of our clients do these types of things so that they want to get in the, uh, that safety zone. On to the next slide. Again, who can apply the importer, uh, foreign exporter, foreign producer, and so forth. You've got to have standing. That's the word I was looking for. You've got to have standing to bring this thing and make the application. Uh, you have to put it in a particular form and there's a D memo that tells you how to do it and outlines the information as to how you put it together. Next slide, please. There's certain, uh, there's a standard for issuing an NCR and uh, you know, the applicant will be given 30 days or such longer period as the letter may require to provide additional information and so forth. So there's an iterative process. You give the uh, application, the government gets it, then they say, well, we need more information and the person gives more information and there's, back and forth until there's a point where you reach um, the decision point. On to the next slide. Again, uh, you can't do it in all cases. If it's a hypothetical, too many goods, um, you got to ask for, um, you don't have enough information. It doesn't meet the requirements in the manner and form in, section, uh, in D11111. You're out of the running. On to the next slide. It's binding on both sides. Again, you reach this point, it's binding on the CBSA and the applicant until a change occurs uh, or it's uh, being revoked as a result of a dispute or determination or the legislation's amended or something happens to uh, the regulatory regime. Next slide, please. Uh, again, appeal uh, and, uh, and maybe it might be a time limited NCR uh, I've never seen one, but okay. Where uh, 
the, the, there is a legislative or regulatory reference, it ceases to be a valid from the effective date of the legislative amendment. Uh, and uh, cases can determine these things. And then, of course, if a, a judicial decision uh, overrides what's being done. On to the next slide. Well, you can uh, you can dispute the process, and uh, there's a there's a, a way of doing it. Uh, Dave's an expert in doing these things. I wouldn't uh, suggest that somebody that's a novice to the process uh, do it themselves. It's like do it yourself brain surgery. On to the next. <laughs> Go ahead, David. You were going to say. Well, something. I was just going to say uh, it, it's really just a, a B two form. It's just a customs way of saying you pick one entry, and you file the B two. I'm making a particulars on it and you're claiming against um, the, the, uh, the B2. So that's just the, the format. So, um, so I, I, maybe I'll just jump in and get uh, Dan a uh, chance yeah. to get his breathing. So I just want to quickly talk a little bit about U.S. Customs rulings. We won't get too deep into it. But um, uh, unlike uh, Canada, all the U.S. Customs rulings are actually, uh, they, they run the same uh, process that you supply information to them. They are bound um, by, um, like I said, uh, legislation that says that they will get back to you within 30 days. Uh, much of it's, uh, they've got a newly enhanced e-ruling program that's online, which is kind of enlightening because as you see where Dan was speaking about CBSA, everything's written. Um, so this is uh, it's a great way for turning around rulings in a timely fashion and during these uh, um, crazy times of this uh, current uh, COVID pandemic, there's no need for paper to go anywhere, couriers go anywhere. It's all done on a template online. The, um, the only downfall is if you, if the uh, samples are requested, you will have to submit samples, but it, it's speeded up the process. And uh, quite often our US office is getting rulings back from CBP well within the 30 days, sometimes within 20 days. So it's, it's quite frightening how uh, uh, a government body can turn things around that quick um, and give you binding rulings. Now, word of caution, U.S. rulings are all published. You cannot hold back information from U.S. Uh, uh, customs. Uh, they, they use it as a means. They believe that people can actually take a look at past rulings, and therefore, uh, everything is based on past precedent. In Canada, only up until recently, uh, all the rulings have been hidden and only been available to the importer or their uh, respected agent or their attorney. And just recently, um, when you apply for a ruling, they will publish them unless you ask them not to make them published. So if you believe you have a unique uh, mousetrap, you don't want the world to know how you make your mousetrap or where the mousetrap comes from, you can ask that that ruling not be published. So it's, it's, uh, it's very important you do that. So next slide, Alfie. So, um, and this is really just talking about, uh, they have a, a process for re-ruling re requests. Uh, hopefully uh, uh, CBSA is gonna take notice of this uh, sometime. I mean, I know the Brokers Association has long been after lobbying um, uh, uh, CBSA to actually make available all the rulings. Not sure it's gonna happen, but uh, um, most other processes, uh, um, the rulings, as soon as we make application, we actually get a response that they've received it within a day and that um, uh, it, it's, uh, they accept electronic signatures, which uh, something up until recently, uh, CBSA hasn't even entertained, so. Yeah. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, again, um, like uh, CBSA, um, they're going to issue uh, ruling within a time frame, um, and and also um, it, they won't um, issue rulings for anything that's uh, not um, you know prospective shipments. Uh, um, so, some people in the United States, some importers will actually have samples. If they can design a sample and that, that's not a prospective shipment, that actually is, is a future shipment. So, the next slide, Elfie. And uh, CBP, like uh, CBSA rulings, it's just the same things. You name, name address, party, statement, uh, and also uh, who's applying for it. It can either be the importer or the importer's attorney or their appointed uh, customs broker. 
So, and also you, like uh, CBSA, you have to have a statement that it's not, uh, the uh, present product is not before the CVP in any uh, manner as far as an appeal or uh, uh, additional advice from them was issued. So next slide. Um, classification, there's just, uh, it, you have to describe whether you're applying for HS uh, classification or if it's country of origin for trade agreements, uh, or you can ask, you, uh, ask them for uh, rulings as far as uh, origin and marking you know, as far as detailed. And so in those cases, there's a list of uh, what's required. So next slide. And uh, there's a active link where you can actually click on and, and go to and list uh, rulings and the rulings you can track by importer, by uh, who's applied for the importing ruling by products. It's very robust. Um, presently, um, you know, there's, uh, there's um, more than uh, 200,000 rulings that are online with CVP. I put a ruling on there from, uh, oh, this is an old one, it's an eye chart, but it's going back almost 20 years. That, um, that I put in for a customer that's no longer around. And so if you search my name, you'll see a, a ruling comes up in my name. So it's, a, it, like I said, it's pretty robust. Uh, uh, the, the drawback is, is if you have a unique product, if you s apply to CBP, everybody knows what you're bringing that product in as far as the HS code. So um, the rationale by CBP is that that will help people uh, apply for future rulings, but also it'll, it may uh, eliminate the need for companies making like products to actually uh, request rulings. So, and I think that's pretty much it. So um, Dan, if uh, we're, we're a little over today, but uh, I want to thank Dan again for all his help. And Dan, you got any comments to wrap things up? Dan, your mic's not on. Okay, I'm going to unmute. So uh, just the, the, the point being that uh, there's many ways of minimizing risk. One of them is uh, advanced rulings. Another one is to keep track of all the tariffs that are uh, happening from time to time. Now the U.S. has, uh, uh, by way of a stroke of a pen of the president, in, increased tariffs. Uh, and uh, the other uh, one that we commonly see is self audits, taking a look at uh, what you're doing and whether or not uh, things have changed or whether or not you had the information right so that you can be in a position to um, withstand uh, the scrutiny of a verification or audit at some point in time in the future. So uh, I guess with that, we should end. And uh, I want to thank everyone for participating in this program. Uh, we'll have another one uh, up and running in the, in the next uh, couple of weeks. And uh, uh, unless, David, you have anything else, uh, we'll end it there. Nope. I just want to thank everybody for um, reaching in. If you've got any uh, specific questions about your uh, specific issues, by all means, fire me off an email or send one to Dan, and we'll, we'll respond. Stay safe and be well, everyone. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.